Yeah. All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's our first Sapienta of uh, 2020, I believe, right, Ken? Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and uh, this is Gabe uh, Raven from uh, NYU Abu Dhabi. He's been there for the past uh, three years. Is that right? Three years ish, uh, PhD from UCLA uh, before that. And he's going to talk to us about the structure of analog representation. Cool. Thanks, John. And thanks for having me. Um, I'm very honored to be presenting at Dartmouth. Um, and I'm also, I want to give my thanks to ICE, who uh, is to for Cloth Disappearing Engagement, who sponsored my fellowship here. And they're recording the talk here for posterity. So thanks to Marcelo and those guys for this. OK, um, this talk is about analog representation. Basically, I'm trying to figure out what is analog representation and give a positive theory of it and do some methodological stuff and make fun of my enemies. That's my general strategy. I should mention that this is co-authored work. I wrote this with um, two NYU affiliated folks, Andrew Lee, who's now a postdoc at Rice, and Josh Myers, who's a graduate student. Yes, this is a NYU paper. Okay. Um, okay, so first we start off with a just kind of intuitive distinction between analog and symbolic representation. Some paradigms of symbolic representation include the good old English language, uh, mathematical notation, traffic lights, and the example I have here is the system of international maritime signal flags. These are the flags you see if you go up in the harbor, up on the boats, that signal various things about the ships, for instance, if they're about to sail or if they have a man overboard. Okay? And one of the reasons I included those here, they're a little more colorful, but also I wanted to kind of disabuse you of the notion if just because a representation has like some colors or it's two-dimensional or something like that, um, or is in some sense iconic, it's therefore analog. Another word that sometimes people use here is analog, iconic for this distinction also. I'll talk about that in a second. So some paradigms of analog representations include mercury thermometers. Here I'll have a nice example of the mercury thermometer in the snow, reading negative three degrees Fahrenheit, which is about accurate for this morning. Also hand clocks, you know, the type with the, the hand that goes around like that one up there. Uh, photographs and drawings, audio recordings, and perhaps more controversially, visual experiences. Um, okay, so some people would use the word um, iconic for what I'm calling analog here. I want to reserve that for something else. I don't really care too much to fight about the words, but I'm hoping to carve out an interesting representational kind of thing that happens, and you can use whatever word you want for that. Okay. Um, Okay, so when we talk about representational systems in general, there's three parts of them. There's the vehicles, okay, and here we have um, some uh, grade school, the, the system of grade school portraiture, you know, when you get your photo taken in the school, okay. Um, and then you have, so this is supposed to be a, a paradigm of kind of analog representation here, it's not a symbolic system. You have the contents, here these are actually pictures of the adolescent uh, Kovicki siblings, so here's a picture of John when he's 13 years old. The content is the man himself over there. Uh, and these are his sisters, Marie and Antoinette. And there they are, here and here. Okay? And so in addition to the vehicles and the contents, we also have this interpretation function, which takes us from vehicles to contents. Okay? And you've probably seen it before. It often has these double brackets around it if you're doing philosophy of language or semantics. These are the meaning brackets that take you from one to the other. Okay. Um, and so before I even get into giving any positive theory of analog representation, there's just a methodological question first, which is, where do you look? Okay? And there's a bunch of different places to look. And first, I want to just say, um, I put on my, uh, first of all, everyone should have a handout. Um, many of the details are on the talk are on the handout. Um, but the handout is not just a you know, transcription of all the slides or anything like that. But it does have some of the important principles and the details. That way I can't sneak an important principle by you really quickly and before you get a chance to write it down and think of objections. So you have it written, all the important principles are written down. And so right at the top of the handout I have what makes a representation analog. Actually I realize already what I should have said is what makes a representational system analog. So I'm not really interested in whether a particular thermometer is analog or a particular picture, but rather some system of representation uh, is analog. Okay. So first methodological mark is we should look in systems not tokens, okay? Now, given that we're looking at a representational system, we could look in the vehicle, in the nature of the vehicles. Uh, Jacob Beck has a view like that. One version of Nelson Goodman has a view like that. We could look in the contents. John Hauglin has a view like that. We could look in the interpretation function, that is the mapping from vehicles to contents. 
We could look elsewhere. We could look in use properties in certain ways that users interact with those systems. John has a view that's a bit like that. We could also look in the meta semantics. That is, not in, in a way, the nature of the system itself, but in the, the metaphysical story of how that system got to be the way that it is, maybe by a similarity or something like that. That's a view that people have defended. Okay? Now, insofar as there is an orthodoxy in this domain, um, I wouldn't say there's really an orthodoxy, but maybe there's the mainstream view, which I would say is the vehicle view. Um, Jacob Beck, in this recent paper on analog representation, basically says, the question about analog representation is a question about the format of representation. It's a question about the nature or format of the vehicles that do the representing. Okay? But now I want to basically argue against the vehicle view. Okay? Here is an example um, of a symbolic representational system, the system of international maritime signal flags. This is the flag for diver down, keep clear. This is the flag for man overboard. This is the flag for dangerous cargo. I want you to pick your favorite uh, allegedly analog uh, representational vehicles. And I'm not going to change the nature of the vehicles at all. My favorite analog representational vehicles are the photos, the adolescent photos of the Kulvicki family. What I'm going to do is just switch them in here. So I'm going to replace the flags with these, um, the very same vehicles as before. And I'm going to now claim that the resulting system is a symbolic system. If the original system was, this is, a, this is two. And notice I haven't changed the nature of these vehicles at all. Okay? So basically, whatever theory you want to have that, it, that analog representation can be found in the nature of the vehicles, I'll just take your vehicles. I won't change their nature at all. And I'll swap them in for my favorite symbolic representational system. And my claim here is that this resulting system here remains a symbolic system. And in fact, I think you can pull the same trick with the contents. So I could have started with some, I could have swapped out the contents for the contents that you like in an analog representational system. Okay. So the claim I want to make here is that the place to look for the mark of the analog is in the interpretation function. Um, analog representation isn't really about what does the representing or what gets represented, though those things matter. It's about how those vehicles represent those contents. That is the interpretation function. I'll just point out, I didn't argue against the use view, and I didn't argue against the metasemantic view. I'll talk about a use view later, and I won't really talk much about the metasemantic view. But in terms of whether to look in vehicles or contents or interpretation function, I think the answer is look in the function. Okay. Now, this sounds really, it's, I, I, I've kind of oversold things a bit. It sounds like, oh, shoot, I didn't start my timer. Did, anyone, did you start, who's in charge here? Me? <laughs> I'm, I'm in charge. Okay. I'm going to start my timer there, and I'll dock myself four and a half minutes. Okay. Um, where was I? Okay. All right. So I was about to basically um, make myself look not as good as I have up to here. So I acted like I just like defeated the orthodoxy about analog representation, but really things aren't as radical as that. It might turn out that certain versions of the interpretation function view and certain versions of the vehicle view turn out to be extensionally equivalent. That is, they declare all the same representational systems as analog. Because it may be that certain types of vehicles can only have certain types of interpretation functions, and certain types of interpretation functions can only have certain types of vehicles. Sim something similar applies to content. But I think even if there is an extensional equivalence, I think the fundamental reason that the system is analog is going to be found in the interpretation function, not in the nature of the vehicles. Okay? And it also turns out that people who claim to be vehicle theorists, like I just gave this example of Jacob Beck, you know, he says, oh, it's all about the format of the vehicles. But then, like, later that same page, he starts talking about how the vehicles co-vary with their contents. So clearly, he cares about the interpretation function here. So maybe the complaint I'm really making is everybody needs to change the way they do things, but rather, it, given that everybody's already talking about the interpretation, fun interpretation function, the mapping from vehicles to contents, we should just say that rather than pretending that it's just about the vehicles and then going on to talk about the mapping. Okay? So this ends the section on methodology. The overall gist of the methodology is look at the interpretation function. It's the bomb. Okay. Um, a brief formalism here. Um, so for any of these uh, representational systems, Okay, I want to have the fifth thing called the representational space. The representational space has three components, a syntactic space, a semantic space, an interpretation function. Okay, the syntactic space is basically composed of all the potential vehicles that are in the system. 
So the example I have here is the system of mercury thermometers. So in the syntactic space, we'll basically all the different thermometers and the ver un grouped by various heights. So eight, you know, eight centimeters or nine centimeters. Okay. In the semantic space, will be all the different contents that the thermometers have. That is a bunch of temperatures like sixty degrees and fifty degrees and negative five degrees. Okay. Um, I'm gonna and there's also interpretation function which takes you basically from the vehicles, that is from points in the syntax to points in, points in the semantic space to points in the semantic space. That it takes you from vehicles to contents. Okay, an example here is the interpretation of an eight centimeter mercury thermometer is 40 degrees Fahrenheit, let's assume. Okay. One other element, which is a little more non-standard, which is basically I want to ha have the possibility that both the syntactic and the semantic space are kind of structured by certain relations on those space. So in some cases, the space might just be a set of states. But in other case, it's uh, a, set of, a set of states or a set of vehicles uh, structured by certain relations. In the mercury thermometer cases, basically I want to say that the, the heights are basically structured by a taller than relation in terms of height. Because it's structured by a height relation. The temperatures are structured by a warmer than relation. Okay, now. The relations here, actually a single space could be structured by multiple relations. The relations could be binary relations. They could really have any addicity. They could just be um, one place relations, i.e. properties. And in certain cases, there might be no relations at all. You might think in a lot of cases of symbolic representation, there's no kind of relations structuring the space. And in fact, the basic idea of the kind of what I'm calling the structural theory of analog representation is that analog representation occurs when the syntactic space is structured in a certain way, the semantic space is structured in a certain way, and um, the structure of the syntactic space gets mapped to the structure of the semantic space. But more on those details um, later. Okay. Oh, and I. That's fine. I'll just let this. And I just want to be clear when I talk about um, the syntactic space, the points in the syntactic space, the elements in the syntactic space, are not like physical vehicles, thermometers. They're syntactic types. So two physically distinct thermometers, as long as they have the same height of mercury, correspond to the same point in the syntactic space. Okay. So they're syntactic types in the space. OK, so here's an argument, um, which is basically an argument that the syntactic space and the semantic space are the same size, at least for analog representations. Okay. So first, let's imagine that the semantic space is smaller than the syntactic space. So we suppose, for reductio, so to speak, that there are more contents than vehicles. If the semantic space is bigger than the syntactic space, there are more contents than vehicles. Okay? What that means right, is that there are some contents which are not expressed by any element of the syntax, by no vehicle. Okay? That means there are in okay, inexpressible contents. Okay? And I'm basically saying there are no inexpressible contents. Therefore, there are not more contents than vehicle. Simple old modus tollens. Okay? Now, the claim that there are no inexpressible contents is not some highfalutin claim of fancy metaphysics. I have nothing to say about that, that kind of deep and interesting issue. All I'm really saying is, if we have some real world example of a representational phenomenon going on, and we all want to model it using these kind of representational spaces, okay, it would be ad hoc and bizarre and unprincipled to just throw in a bunch of extra inexpressible contents. So for any system which you had inexpressible contents, there's an alternative system which models the, the representational system better in which you don't have the, expression, the inexpressible contents. Okay? So that's an argument that basically the size of the semantic space is always less than or equal to the size of the syntactic space. Okay? Here's an argument that the size of the syntactic space is always less than or equal to the size of the semantic space. Okay? First, it's worth pointing out that a physical difference is insufficient for a syntactic difference. A wooden thermometer and a ceramic thermometer with identical heights of mercury correspond to the same syntactic type. Okay? Now, if it is the case that the syntactic space is bigger than the semantic space, that means that there are two distinct syntactic types that get mapped to the same contents. Okay? Now, those two distinct syntactic types have to, at the least, correspond to two different kind of physical types, or perhaps a variety of physical types. All right? But the question is now, why are you individuating them as two different syntactic types? Okay? And the principle I want to endorse here is basically no syntactic difference, ouch, without a semantic difference. 
Right, the idea is there. There's no reason to say that the, say these two thermometers are distinct syntactic types if they both get mapped to the same content. Okay, so the basic idea then is much like the previous example. It's better to collapse these two. Actually, this is a little bit different than the previous example. In the previous example, I want to get rid of the extra contents. Here, what I'm saying is, instead of having two syntactic types, you're better off individuating the syntactic items such that we have one type, not two. And if you always collapse the syntax in this way, okay, you will never get more syntactic types than semantic types. Okay, so that's the argument. It's going to matter in a second, um, but I just want to point out. I think this is pretty good reasoning for analog representational systems. I, do, I just want to point out that it does not work for a natural language like English. Okay, so in English, actually, the phenomenon of having two distinct um, syntactic types that correspond to the semantic same semantic type is uh, common. For instance, you know, John and Mr. Kovicki perhaps are different syntactic types, but you might think they have the same content. So that's quite common in natural language. And the reason for that is basically that when it comes to natural language, we have an antecedent grip on the syntax of the language that is at least somewhat prior to the contents. And in fact, there's a kind of methodological uh, goal that some syntacticians have, which is to basically do kind of content-free syntax and to let the syntax be a prior discipline that later feeds into the semantics. However, when it comes to analog representation, um, I think in most cases we don't really have a good grip. I don't really have a good grip on how to syntactically individuate thermometers other than asking the question, like, what types of differences make a difference to what temperature they represent, right? And so actually, I would be really curious if anybody had some good examples of analog or iconic or any other types of representation that aren't just like clearly symbolic, and which is kind of an antecedent content-free grasp on syntactic individuation. I'd be curious for examples of that. Okay, um, good. Uh, let's proceed. Oh, now my clicker's not working? Bum, 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 bum. Oh, I see what's going on. I got confused. Okay, where are we? Ah, okay, okay. Um, so here's the kind of beginning of the positive theory, which I call the structural theory of analog representation. The basic idea is that, as I mentioned earlier, is a matter of the representation function mapping syntactic structure to semantic structure. Okay? And this theory, that's the basic idea, but that's kind of vague in a way, so I want to spell it out in four specific ways. Um, the first is an isomorphism requirement. It basically says the interpretation function must be an isomorphism. That's a particular type of structure-preserving mathematical function. Okay? Um, this is a binary requirement. Basically, you either, are, you either are an isomorphism or you are not. Okay? The other three requirements are basically three degree theoretic notions of analogness. Okay? Uh, they're called purity, mass, and strength. And the basic idea is as you get more purity, more mass, and more strength, you are more analog. Okay? And I'll talk about each of these kind of in turn. Okay? So first, briefly on isomorphism. Actually, this slide, I'm going to skip over most of the details because it just takes too damn long. But an isomorphism is just a specific type of structure-preserving mathematical function. It basically needs to be a bijection, which, bas which just means that for every element of the domain, there's an el only one element of the range. And for every element of the range, there is exactly one element of the domain that maps to it. And it also means that if there's some relation on the domain and two elements bear that relation, then there's analogous relation on the range, such that the values, if you, you know, kind of transfer them across to the range, take the values in the function, the values bear that same relation. Okay? Bear the domain relation. Okay? Sorry. If two elements of the domain bear the domain relation, their values in the range bear the range relation. Okay? And I used x here for the domain and y uh, for the range. Okay? And I had a bunch of kind of complaints about isomorphism, but I just want to point out that, I mean, isomorphism is a, um, people have talked about isomorphism in literature and analog representation. Often, they're just using the word isomorphism to mean like, hey, structure is cool, or like structure is important or something like that. They're not really using it in the technical sense. They just want to use the word, things are isomorphic in the sense that they have similar structure or something like that. So they're really only paying lip service to the idea. So that's partly to say that later when I actually require that something's an isomorphism, I mean it in the more strict mathematical sense. The other idea is a lot of talk about isomorphism is a little bit too loosey-goosey. Um, because isomorphism, a lot of people, people often talk about isomorphism between one domain and another. And that kind of actually doesn't 
quite make sense. Isomorphism isn't really a relation between one domain and another, but rather a relation between one domain and certain relations on that domain, and another domain and certain relations on that domain. And in fact, the very same function, which is an isomorphism from one domain under certain relations to a different domain under certain relations, might not be an isomorphism from that, between those very two same domains with different relations. Okay? And so it's really, you have, when you claim isomorphism, you need to be really clear about what the domain is and what relations you're talking about, basically. Okay? And this is where this fancy math comes up here. Uh, but I'm not really going to go through this example. But if you're like mathematically inclined and you're curious and you get bored as I'm talking through, this function, f of x equals 2 to the x, is an isomorphism between the real numbers on addition and the positive real numbers in multiplication. Okay? And importantly, this function is not an isomorphism between the real numbers under addition and the positive reals under addition. So it just shows that you really got to specify the relations. Okay? Another problem with talking about isomorphism is that if you don't specify the relations, is that like in a certain sense, relations are abundant and there's lots of them. So if you just say, oh, there's an isomorphism between them, then your claim isn't quite trivial, but if you allow any relations whatsoever, then any claim of isomorphism just reduces to the claim about bijection, about sameness of size, which is a lot less boring and less interesting. Okay? And the last point is that if you want to use the notion of isomorphism to account for analog representation, I don't think the phrase, there is an isomorphism, does it. Okay? Because, for instance, take our international maritime signal flags example. Suppose that there are many angels in heaven, and each angel has a favorite flag. There are many demons in hell, and each demon has a favorite content that it uses to lure sailors at sea to their deaths. Okay? And it just turns out each angel has a nemesis who's a demon, and each demon has a nemesis who's an angel. And it just turns out that the, each angel has a certain flag as its favorite, and each demon has a certain content in its favorite. It just turns out that the, if you have a given angel and they have a certain flag as their favorite, then their nemesis demon has the content of that flag as their favorite. So basically there's like an isomorphism now between the flags and the contents. And it preserves the relation where the, where the, do, the relation on the domain is the favorite of the angel and relation on the range is the favorite of the demon. Okay? This is a crazy example, but we can even suppose that being the favorite of an angel or demon is a sparse property. But the point is supposed to be, the fact that you're the, there's an isomorphism here, maybe it's even a sparse isomorphism. That is, it doesn't use some made-up fake property. But notice, being the favorite of the angel or demon is completely irrelevant to why those flags have the content that they do. So I think it should be completely irrelevant to whether the system is analog or not. So there is an isomorphism. I think it's just toothless, basically. So this leads to my claim. Here's your fa back to my favorite, the interpretation function. So here I don't say there is an isomorphism, but I say if the representational system is analog, then the interpretation function itself is an isomorphism. And that is a much more substantive claim. Okay? And earlier, all, you might have wondered, why was he talking about the syntactic space and the semantic space? Well, because if there's an isomorphism between them, they have to be the same size. There has to be a bijection, basically. So the argument I gave earlier was, in effect, secretly an argument that there was a bijection between the syntactic space and the semantic space. Just to give an example here, talk about our mercury thermometers. Okay, Here, on the syntactic side, we have a height relation or a taller than relation. And what isomorphism requires in this case is that 8 centimeters is less than 10 centimeters, if and only if the content of 8 centimeters is less than, in terms of temperature, the content of 10 centimeters. And here, I'm, telling, I'm just stipulating that the content of 8 centimeters is 40 Fahrenheit and the content of 10 centimeters is 50 Fahrenheit. So that's just one example, but if I were to write out the isomorphism, we'd say basically for every height and every temperature, um, the if, if the two heights have the taller than relation between them, their values in terms of temperature have the warmer than relation between them. Okay. All right. Now this is, I think, a cool requirement but actually just isn't enough, okay? And here's why. Here's my example. It's called sized letters, okay? So the, the vehicles in the sized letters example, the elements of the syntactic space are a bunch of letters of the alphabet. Every letter comes in three sizes, big, medium, and small, okay? And um, 
So there's 26 times 3, 72 different vehicles in the system. The contents of each letter is a person, okay? Um, big K stands for the uh, eldest sibling of the Kulvicki family. Medium K stands for the middle-aged sibling. And small K stands for the youngest sibling, okay? So big K stands for John here. Middle K stands for Marie. Small K stands for Antoinette, okay? Um, just to be clear, John doesn't actually have any siblings named Marie and Antoinette, but he's rolling. He's rolling with me for the example. Okay, I have no idea whether John has siblings or not, actually. Um, anyways, I'm, I'm stipulating in this case John is the oldest. Okay, but what's going on here is that there is a size relation among the vehicles. There's big K, little K, small K, and there's also basically an older than relation uh, among the contents. And every time two vehicles are related by the larger than relation. Their contents are related by the older than relation. That's what's going on here. But th so the system actually, we have an isomorphism here. Okay? So basically, because bigger than corresponds to older than. But the problem here is that it's true that we're getting structure preservation. But the problem is that there like, wasn't much structure to start with in the first place. And you can, maybe the system doesn't seem analog at all to you. Uh, maybe you think, you should think, even if it doesn't seem analog, like it, things could get a lot more analog. I think what's actually going on here is the system is like a little bit analog because it's got the size thing going on. And then there's all these other, what I would call, purely nominal differences. That is, the difference between B and C isn't like an analog difference. Okay? All right. So what we want to do is account for this by requiring more structure, so to speak. Okay? So here's the distinction I was just talking about. There's really two different ways states can be distinct. Okay? The first is that they're structurally distinct. The distinction between, I don't know if this is a medium or a small a. Medium A and big A is a structural difference. They're related by the size relation. They're, one's taller than the, bigger than the other. Or two states can be nominally distinct. That is, A and B are distinct states, but the only reason A is distinct from B is because it's just not B and B is not A. Okay? So those are two types of distinctions. And now this, this, this difference in structural nominal distinctness um, is going to make a difference later. And notice, I can, there's actually a definition of nominally and structurally distinct in terms of the structural, rela the relations that I had on the syntactic and the semantic space. Okay. okay, so then I have this notion which I call analog purity. Okay, so let me just explain. Uh, the analog purity of a representational system is the proportion of the structural differences to overall differences. Okay, the basic idea is this. Some states are distinct due to structural differences because they have different sizes, okay? Some states are distinct, but they're not different. They're not distinct in virtue of some structural difference. There's a, what I would call a merely nominal difference, difference between A and B. And the purity increases as more of the differences in the system are due to structural differences in general, okay? And so there's a, uh, the formalism here, I give you a score, uh, the analog purity score of any system is basically the size of the structural partition over the size of the total partition, okay? Um, so a partition is just, um, if you have some, some set of elements, a partition it basically is a grouping of the elements into subsets such that every element gets into exactly one subset. For instance, I could take the people in this room and I could put a partition in terms of the men and the women. Or I can partition you into the people who did their degree in the United States and the people who did their degree elsewhere. Those are all partitions. Okay? The total partition is, is very simple. It's just basically where, the, oh, sorry, in this, the subsets of a partition we call the cells of the partition. Everybody gets into one cell. Okay? The total partition is just a partition in which every distinct element gets its own cell. So everybody's in the cell by themselves. Okay, this is really just the number of different possible states in the system. That's all that is. The number of different possible ways the vehicles could be, say. Okay, the structural partition is more interesting. Um, it has to do with basically the idea is you only pay attention to structural differences. So in the structural partition of the size letter system, all the big letters get in one cell, all the medium letters get in a second cell, and all the small letters get in a third cell. So the size of the structural partition in the size letters examples is three, okay? So each cell in the structural partition corresponds to, in fact, a given structural way of being uh, within the representational system. And this applies also, all the examples I'm giving only involve kind of one structural relation, 
But this is a mental apply to systems which have multiple structural relations. For instance, the letter, if I introduce colors of the letters too, that might make a difference structurally. Okay, so the purity score here of this system is 3 over 72, which you notice is pretty low, which maybe corresponds to your point about how analog this system is. But notice what I'm saying is this system is more analog than a system in which there were just the letters but no sizes of letters at all. Okay? And also, please don't, don't pay too much attention to the number here. All the numbers are really to do is allow you to compare systems, compare purity of systems. I don't actually mean to claim that a system with 6 over 72 purity is like twice as pure as another system. It's only really meant to give you an ordinal ranking um, of the systems. Okay? It, also, it also feeds into the next criterion, which is what I call analog mass. Um, okay, so the analog mass basically is just a measure of the number of different kind of structural distinctions in the system. So the analog mass of a system increases as the number of structural distinctions increases. So if there's more ways to be structurally, then the system is more analog. Okay? So here, the analog mass score is actually easier than before. It's just the size of the structural partition. So in the sized letters example, the analog mass of the system is 3. Okay? Um, and if I had more different sizes of letters, then the analog mass would be, would be greater. Okay? I want to talk about a slightly different example here, which is imagine a population density map, which uses red hues, just that darker hues represent greater population density. Okay? Um, so the idea is now we have an isomorphism between darkness of the red hues and density of population. A system which had five hues and five um, different population densities it could represent would have less analog mass than a system which had 50 red hues and 50 population densities. But notice, if there were no distinctions in the system other than hue, both systems would have a purity of 1, actually, because every distinction in the system comes from a structural distinction. This also points out another feature. Analog purity has a maximum of 1. When every, when every distinction in the system is due to a structural distinction, it has maximal analog purity. But analog mass does not have a maximum because you could always just keep tacking on more and more structural distinctions. And notice that analog mass is basically the numerator of the division that led to purity. Okay? So purity, in a way, is the analog mass over the number of possible states in the system. Okay. Um, let me look at my notes here. Good. Okay. Um, there's another notion called analog strength, which I don't want to talk too much about. But the basic idea here is that, I mean, I, the, the, the slogan is the analog strength of a representational system measures the strength of its structural relation. Well, strength measures strength, duh, right? Okay? But the basic idea is some relations entail others. So if you had two systems which are otherwise identical, but one had a relation that kind of impo that, that entailed the other. That is, imagine you had a system with an ordering a one-dimensional ordering, and another system which not only had an ordering but had a distance between points in the system. Once you had a distance metric like that, that would entail the ordering, but the ordering doesn't entail the distance relations. Okay? So that would, the, the distance metric is like stronger and it like more richly structures the system, I would say. It counts as having more strength. Okay? I'm going to skip through the examples now because I'm going to run out of time if I do. Okay, so here's the kind of... Um, very picture painty way to think about all of this. Here's the hand of structure. There it is. Here's the hand of structure. Okay? The hand of structure is supposed to be like molding the representational system. Mass is about how large the hand of structure is. How many structural distinctions are there? Purity is about what proportion of the system is shaped by the hand of structure. Okay? And then strength is about once the hand of structure like grabs the system, how strongly does it shape it? Okay? And I'm also trying to be quite ecumenical about the various ways to be more and less analog. Um, I don't want to give you a number where I balance the purity against the strength, against the mass, and I give you a single score. I'm basically thinking that there's lots of ways to be more and less analog. Different versions of these will account for different types of intuitions about different types of cases. And these are all interesting dimensions of analogicity. Okay. Um, okay. Here's the part where I disparage my rivals. I've already kind of disparaged 
if there is an isomorphism view, which I don't really think there is, there's just the word isomorphism floats around a lot. Um, but let me talk about a couple of these. Okay, magnitude theory. So the idea of a magnitude mirroring is that analog representation is a matter of magnitudes of the vehicle mapping to analog, mapping to magnitudes of the content. So it looks like an interpretation function view. Thumbs up for that. Here's a quote by Chris Peacock. Analog representation is representation of magnitudes by magnitudes. That's the thing I put on, on, on your handout as the definition of the view. Um, some examples of magnitudes are length, mass, temperature, duration. Key, fe key features of magnitudes are that they have multiple values coming in lesser or greater extent. Okay. Um, all right. Now, my complaints here are basically that magnitude accounts are too narrow. Because in general, magnitude accounts are uh, one-dimensional, okay? And so what that means is um, they can't capture certain types of structure. Here I have the example of Hue. Hue has what I would call a circular structure. Um, Jacob Beck has this quote where he says, the representation of one magnitude by a second magnitude is such that the second magnitude has the function of increasing or decreasing with the first. So if you have colors here, it doesn't really make sense to increase or decrease in hue, all right? So basically the problem is I want to allow for much richer structures uh, that don't fit into the idea of magnitudes, okay? Uh, the, other ex the other complaint against the account is it's kind of a binary account. It just says either magnitudes represent magnitudes or they don't. And so you're either analog or you're not, and it loses all the kind of fine degree of variation that I want to have in the middle. Okay, abstraction theories. Um, here we come to the fireworks, okay? Abstraction theory, most famously defended by Mr. John Kulvicki, okay? Um, and the basic idea here is analog representation is representation that supports abstraction. John would use a bunch of other fancy words like vertical articulation, things like that, but I don't think I need to use that, that to get the basic idea across. Um, the basic idea, oh, let me not go to the objections yet. The basic idea is that approximate syntactic identity corresponds to approximate semantic identity. Or you could put it this way, determinables of syntax correspond to determinables of content. So let me just give an example. If you have a thermometer, basically a range of heights of thermometer corresponds to a range of temperatures. That's, that's the basic idea, okay? Um, and I do think that's actually an interesting feature of analog representation, <laughs> but my main complaint basically is that I think abstraction is basically a symptom of the nature of the interpretation function, not the real source of analog representation. So even if John and I wind up agreeing about which representations are analog, um, I'm going to claim I got like deeper, cut deeper at the joints or something like that. Okay? And on, a, on, a, on another level actually, I think that John's view is kind of overly perspectival perspective is not, maybe not the right way to put it. His, his account is really all about a certain type of interaction. He talks a lot about this users can do a certain thing with the representation, a certain interaction that users have. And there's a lot of focus on the user's discriminatory capabilities if they can tell when there's two distinct syntactic types and their representational needs. Here's a quote. As the number of abstractions available decreases to the point that they do not outrun the needs of ordinary language users in ordinary contexts, representations cease to be analog. So John's basically idea is the boundary of the analog comes when there's so many abstractions that you couldn't possibly use them all. But that makes analog representation subject to the kind of needs of the users and, and things like that in a way that I find, I don't know if it's overly perspectival or overly anthropomorphic, I don't know exactly. Um, but I want to make it subject basically to the nature of the function, which will lead to these types of abstractions, I think. Um, because of the nature of the structural stuff, but isn't really the right source. That's my complaint against John. Another type of theory I want to complain about is uh, the density theory, okay? And the density theory you often see, analog representation is often contrasted also with digital representation, which is kind of like sort of similar to symbolic, but maybe not exactly. Um, and so, um, Analog representations, Nelson Goodman famously defended what I would call a density theory. His basic idea was that analog representational systems are syntactically and semantically dense. What does that mean? It means that between any two syntactic types, there's a third. Between any two semantic types, there's a third. 
Notice it actually works for the thermometers. Between any two heights of a thermometer, there's a third height. Between any two temperatures, there's a third temperature. So it looks good for thermometers, OK? Um, now, this does require a kind of ordering of the states. You have a betweenness notion between states. But um, I'll, I'll spot Goodman that for now. My, one of my complaints is it kind of, I think, undershoots the extent of the analog. So here, imagine we have, again, our population density map with 10 hues of red, such that darker hues represent greater population densities. This example strikes me as analog, even if between the darkest red hue and the second darkest, there is no type in between them. And in fact, if, if you don't like this example, make it 100 shades of hues, or 1,000 shades of red hues that represent population density. But as long as it doesn't have the density property, it will be fail to be good, analog in Goodman's sense. Okay? So I think Goodman's kind of like you know, um, sniffing around the right area, but his, 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 it, it kind of undershoots it a little bit. And I think it also overshoots it. So imagine a different type of map where you had infinitely different, many infinitely red hues, okay, such that, and you had darker and lighter hues, and you had infinitely many different population densities you could represent. But darkness in red hue didn't correspond to greater po population densities. So the mapping was what I would call a crazy mapping in all different types of ways. It would still be syntactically dense between any two hues as another. It's semantically dense between any two hues as another. But the problem is basically that there's no isomorphism. That's basically the problem here. The structure of one isn't mapping to the structure of the other. Okay. Now I do think that, um, oh, let me go back here, um, that the density account is on the right track. There's something really weird about this system um, because it's going to be really hard to figure out what's going on. Notice that if you had this population density map and you looked at a hue and you weren't absolutely sure exactly which hue it was, then you would have no idea what the content was. Because really, if you, sh if, the hue, if you were subtly wrong about what hue it was, you could be radically wrong about the population. Now, if the system has the feature that John talked about, the abstraction feature such that approximate values of syntax correspond to approximate semantic values, then you'd be safe. So the point is, in order for systems, for dense systems to be interpretable, I think basically they need to be analog and have a structure preserving interpretation function, and they need to support the type of abstractions that John talked about. And John makes this point very nicely in his paper where he says, look, density is kind of like in the right area, but dense systems have a certain feature in order to be interpretable. It's that feature that matters, not the density itself. And I think John's absolutely right about that. I just think that he should, you know, it's more about the nature of the interpretation function, not the abstractions. OK. Uh, OK. Here we get on to the juicy bits where I offer some objections and replies. OK. So here's, I think, a, probably a big objection a lot of you thinking of. You're thinking, what the hell does this guy mean by structure or relations? Are there some structure on the syntax or structure? Isn't there lots of structure out there? One idea there is that relations and the structure are cheap. So analog representation is cheap. The idea is here, for any system whatsoever, you can just define up some relations on the vehicles, define up some relations on the contents, such the interpretation function preserved that mapping. And the result, if that's right, then every system will have isomorphism. Every system will have maximal purity and high analog mass and all the rest. Okay? So here's an example. Scrambled thermometer. Uh, this is uh, similar to the weird population density map. The here, oh, I should use centimeters. I don't know why I didn't use centimeters. Interpretation of one inch of mercury, let's say, is 80 degrees. Two inches is 70 degrees, so it dropped down. Then three inches is 92 degrees. So the idea is the mapping doesn't respect the height relations. Okay? And so you might think, ah, there's a failure of isomorphism because the height of mercury isn't corresponding to the taller than in terms of the heights isn't corresponding to warmer than on the contents. But wait, there's this other relation warmer than star, such that 80 is less than warmer than star 70, which is less than warmer than star 92. So there is an isomorphism between taller than on the, co on the vehicles and warmer than star on the contents. And lo and behold, it's analog representation, OK? All right. Um, OK. So here's my replies, OK? First reply is, there's no such relation. Okay, and there's really two different ways to do this. One is to get very, very metaphysical and say, 
only sparse relations exist. Abundant relations don't exist. The other is a little more ecumenical, and I don't need, you know, I don't have to get in highfalutin metaphysics, is to say that only sparse relations count for analog representation. Okay? So you could take that option. The option I prefer is a little bit different, actually, which is a more, much more substantive claim, which I'm going to call interpretation function realism. Okay, and this is a, something that's actually going on in the background, which is quite important. I'm actually going to jump to the next slide and talk about it. Okay, so the basic idea of interpretation function realism is that there is a fact of the matter about what form an interpretation function for representational system takes. That is, it's not just about, interpretation function is not just a set of inputs and a set of outputs. Here I have on the board uh, f of x equals x squared and g of x equals a bunch of crap. Okay. Now it turns out these all have the same inputs and outputs. If you like do the math here and cancel things out and associate in the right way, you realize that these are basically, in some sense, the same function. It does turn out that mathematicians prefer to individuate functions in a way in which functions really are just input-output pairs. That's like the dominant way of thinking about it. That was not always so. There was a time when there was a debate about are functions input-output pairs or are they rules? for getting from inputs to outputs. What I'm saying is, when it comes to thinking about interpretation functions, we should really not be thinking about inputs and outputs, but rather about what's the rule by which you get from inputs to the outputs. And even stronger, I want to say that the interpretation function itself takes the taller than relation and gives the warmer than relation as an output. Okay. So just going back, so I'm, I'm, that's what the claim I want to endorse. Why does that matter back here? Well, because what I want to say is, it's just false in the scrambled thermometer system, that the, th that the thermometer is really using the warmer than star relation. It's a, it's a relation that exists in some sense, but that the function is not using that. It's not in the rule, so the system doesn't count as analog, because that rule, that relation is not part of the interpretation function. Another option is to say, so you could also say, suppose warmer than star really is in the interpretation function. Okay? How would that happen exactly? Okay? Imagine some aliens such that their body operates in a weird way and they really like certain temperatures and not others and it doesn't like, it doesn't correspond to our normal orderings of temperatures, okay? If there were aliens with vastly different perceptual systems than us that really did operate with warmer than star, then I think such a system really would be analog. If warmer than star really is in the interpretation function, then, um, the system would be analog using warmer than star. Okay? And here I also, so the scrambled in thermometer theater might actually would be analog if warmer than star really is in the interpretation function. Okay? And I also want to offer a kind of meta-semantic error theory for why you might think it's not analog. And that's because for creatures like us, it is impossible for us to create a system that is analog that uses warmer than star because we just can't perceive it and there's no way for that that relation to get into the interpretation function. But for aliens who perceive in a different way, it could happen. Okay. Um, here's an objection. English is analog. Okay. An English sentence has syntactic structure. The proposition it expresses has analogous structure. So English is analog. But that's a paradigm of symbolic representation. Okay. Now I want to point out this assumes a kind of structured content view that like you have a syntactic tree and it maps to like a structured proposition. You're not going to believe this if you think contents are sets of possible worlds or something like that. But let's just assume that there's structured contents in this way. Okay. Um, I basically want to admit that this is kind of right, but English will still get very low purity and mass scores because most of the distinctions are basically just bare distinctions between the number of distinctions in English. There is these structural features, but there's also just a lot of words that just differ in being different words. So it's going to get low purity and mass scores. And I think this is actually correct because English is actually, I think, more analog than Wittgenstein's slab language, where you just had words for things. Like you just have like slab and beam and no structure at all on the representations. They're all atomic in a sense. So I think actually English should count as more analog. Um, so I just turn this objection into a benefit, maybe. Okay. A um, couple final features. I already talked about the realism. Um, I also want to talk about a feature I call semantic fecundity, which I think is an interesting feature of analog systems. A representational is semantically fecund insofar as it has high expressive power compared to the simplicity of its interpretation function. Okay? It's a very fancy way of putting it. What I really mean is you get a lot of expressive bang for your interpretive buck. 
The idea is, you, for a few simple rules, you get to express a lot of contents. So here's uh, two different examples of systems which have actually the same contents in the same vehicles. It's once again our 10 red hue population density map. The stipulative interpretation function just tells you explicitly what the content of every single hue is. This hue maps to this population density. This hue maps to that one. The fecund one basically says, look, darker than maps to denser than. And I'm going to give you the values at the top and the bottom. And I'm going to distribute the remainder evenly. Okay? Now maybe that's maybe that's a little bit of a complicated thing, but you can see how this same, this same, these same semantic rules would actually work for a 100 red hue population density map or a thousand red hue population density map. Okay, so you're getting a lot more kind of expression of content for, with less rules. Okay, and this property semantic fecund I think explains some features of analog systems. One is that they're easier to learn. To learn this system, notice you have to learn e the meaning of each vehicle individually. Imagine if there are a thousand of them. To learn this system, you just need to learn, okay, what, is, what, does, what does darker than mean? Oh, it means denser than. Okay, and then you need like a couple spots. Okay, what, is this, what does this red hue mean? What does that red hue mean? And then you're kind of off to the races. Okay? They're also easier to create. If you think of yourself tasked with the job of creating the representational system, to create the stipulative system, you have to like write down what each thing means. Okay? Whereas to, do, to, to generate a, a, a fecund system, you basically just lay down a couple rules and let the rest kind of do itself. It does have one big disadvantage though, which is that it's not modular. It's, it's a lot harder to modify a system after the fact. If I wanted to add an extra hue to this system, I could just write it in there. If I wanted to change one of the hues in this system, I can't change it without changing everything else. So all the meanings kind of like mixed up with each other. This is actually an idea that John Hauglin had about all the meanings being mixed up with each other. Okay? So if you wanted a system that was easy to learn and easy to create, then you'd try to do it analogically. If you wanted a system that you wanted to modify later after the fact and you wanted it to be highly flexible, then you would go for a symbolic system. And of course, you only even have the option. Um, I mean, this is kind of what I'm saying, where to expect the analog. This is just a, a somewhat repetition of the self I said earlier. But importantly, it's only going to be amenable to analog representation in the first place if it has the type of structure on which there could be an isomorphism or you could have the structural mapping. If you don't have that, it's just a non-starter. If you do have the structure, then you still have the option. You can ask yourself, do I want ease of learning or do I want ease of creation? Or do I want kind of flexibility and the ability to alter the system down the road? Okay, I'll stop there. I'll thank my co-authors, Andrew Lee and Josh Myers. And I'll thank John for pretending this is what he looked like when he was 13 years old. <laughs>
Um, you could also do a degree theoretic isomorphism requirement. Maybe here's some way to do it. The, the main actually reason I didn't do that here is because it actually makes things way more complicated if you don't have it. If you don't have the isomorphism requirement, then you, you might actually lose the kind of um, the idea that the semantic space and the syntactic space have the same size. Okay? And as soon as you do that, actually, you have two notions of analog purity, syntactic purity, semantic purity, syntactic mass, semantic mass, strength on both sides, and all of a sudden I have like a six degrees instead of three. The, when I have the isomorphism, basically I can like just take the semantic and syntactic side and just collapse them and just talk about one thing, which is what I did here. So, I mean, we, that's just a, I mean, that I'm not sure that's a good theoretical reason, but just to make things like a lot uglier in terms of like, you know, expressing things. So I think, in a way, I think probably the truth is closer to, you know, getting, there could be a degreed isomorphism and then you'd separate the types of purity, but then we'd get like, just so much stuff that it gets pretty unwieldy. So that, that's, I mean, that's kind of why I didn't do it that way. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I, yeah, maybe a quick follow-up, and then I think it's the same kind of question in a way, but it's yeah. both about cases where you don't, it's about being too narrow and, and maybe too loose. I think they stem from the yeah. same thing about isomorphism. So I was wondering, in Peter's example, the process seems right, but also even your best example or your favorite example of John as a child here, it seems like, say, that representation, it, it's on this, I mean, it looks like a nice screen, but it, say it's HD, there's going to be a certain number of pixels, and that's just going to determine, like, basically the partition size, like, the total partition we can have for what it can represent, and that's not going to be the same in terms of the um, actual, in, like, the thing in the world. Like, there's not going to be a nice mapping, because anything that's going to have that limit is not going to have the same partition size. So this, I think this is basically just a generalization of John's worry to say that I think there's going to be a bunch of cases which we would normally think of as, oh, sorry, not John's worry, yeah. Peter's worry, um, yeah. where we think of them as, as typically analog. But then the, the other worry, which I think is, is in some sense related, is like I, I to take a, take a map with the hues and then just say, now oh, we have dark and light, those are only two, yeah. and we have just above 500,000 and below 500,000. Yeah. That's our, you know, that's our, those are vehicles and that's our, that's our content. And I think here he says that would be analog. Is that right? Uh, basically, yes. It, de it actually depends on the details. It depends on basically how you write the rules. If you write light means this and dark means that, then it's actually symbolic. But if instead it says uh, lighter than means uh, denser than or less dense or something like that, then it would be analog. So it actually turns on whether it turns on whether the lighter than relation really gets in to the interpretation function. That's that's what it turns on. But you're right. I mean, yours is like a more extreme version of my size letters. Right? You do three. You're like, let me reduce it to two. Um, yeah. So it, it it does have that implication in certain cases, but depends. Thing is, it's hard to think about that type of case because I can't imagine a real world scenario where someone where that system came to operate in a way in which you didn't just ass, just explicitly assign light and dark those two values, in which you really did it in an analog way, most of the cases I'd imagine you'd have done it in a symbolic way, basically. So it's not about there is this isomorphism. Yeah. yeah, but supposing that the integration function does yeah. have... It would count as analog, yeah. yeah. Um, but you don't feel like that's a... You're just like, well, that's okay. Or you're, I mean, that just looks to me like the sort of, exactly the sort of case we wouldn't want to say is analog, but... Yeah, well, I, no, I would say it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I admit that you, but I, 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 what, I'm, what I was trying to say earlier is I'm trying to explain away your intuition about that case because you're thinking about how it would ordinarily work for a case like that. So this is me giving an error theory to your intuitions. About, uh, about the digital photograph thing, I'm not sure I'm picking up what you're putting down because I have, I mean, there's a, this is just a common thought that people have. is like, oh, your digital photographs aren't going to turn out. It's analog or something like that, right? So the, the thought I've always had about those is, it's not about, so the question is, what is um, the interpretation function? And my thought has always been, you're right that there's a limit to the resolution. Maybe the limit's really bad, I don't know. But my thought has always been, the interpretation function is built to handle much higher and perhaps even infinitely higher res resolution. So the interpretation function is such that it can handle all the other stuff. 
And we should be looking at the interpretation function, not in some sense the limits of the vehicles that we happen to actually have or something like that. But, that, but now I'm worried that I wasn't picking up your objection right. I just, yeah. I, I, I think I'm confused. I thought, um, I thought you were saying for there to be an isomorphism, we have to have the same size requirement. Yeah. Okay, That's so, right. And then take digital pictures and things that the contents we might intuitively think of them as you know, referring to. And how can there be, how can there be the same, how can the same size requirement be met between those two? Um. So I mean, I sorry. I now I'm. Um, so. What what are we can we would you say what we're supposed can we make just make the contents like patterns of light on surfaces or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so. I guess, I guess first I would maybe just suppose that the con the contents, the, there's exactly as many contents as there are different syntactic states. So, I mean, I guess you're thinking maybe that the contents are more fine-grained or something, there's more contents? Okay, good. But what I would have said is basically that the, uh, the syntactic type is, corresponds to basically, it's actually veridical of quite a variety of what I think you're thinking of as, as different contents. And those are just one, that's just one content. Sorry, I feel like I'm not expressing this well. But um, I would want to, I would want to, I would, in that case, I think I would want to just, yeah, all the different scenes in the world yeah. of which that picture is a vertical representation. I admit that some of those scenes are different, yeah. but they all correspond to one kind of content type. I see. What you're those saying the, is simplify the content space yeah. in such a way that I can get dice and work as That's what I'm saying, exactly. I see. So the sense in which digital pictures are analog representations, they're not analog representations of content as I might naturally think of it as the current world. They're analog representations of, in some sense, a abstracted version of the actual world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. In that, okay. Something like that. I mean, I, I'm just thinking, I mean, what I would just think of is like there's a content and I would want to know what things in the world is it veridical of. Mm -hmm. And there's actually quite a variety of different real world states, so to speak. Uh, but I don't think that's any different than the way lots of other representations operate, basically. Yeah. The world's always usually more fine-grained than the, the thing yeah, which is Yeah, it seems like the thermometer example is like this beautiful case because in some ways it doesn't seem more fine-grained than the... That's right. I think that's right, actually, yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. I want to ask a little bit about your uh, interpretation function realism. Yeah, and good. One aspect of your criticism of John's position. So I'm friendly to the idea that for our interpretation of, for the reading of function here for interpretation function go intentional, so it's not input-output, but it's rather the rule. And uh, it's intuitive in a lot of ways, but one of the criticisms of John is that his one aspect is that it's anthropocentric in a certain way. But it feels like we go for nice looking rules when you're a rule reader of functions. Yeah in a way that feels parochial, right? That, yeah, it's creatures like us do great with these rules. And once you put on board, I can't remember if it was a Martian or whoever, yeah, yeah. Might, like, uh, then it seems like if there was real teeth to thinking that John's, well, some, that John's in a position of having to wear anthropocentrism in an unhappy way, it seems like you're coming some distance back on that. That what like, motivates the realism turns, it's gonna turn out to do something like, it's it's a nice making function for its users. Yeah, good. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, cool. That's cool. I hadn't thought about that. So this is the uh, revenge of anthropocentric objection on my on my realism about the rules. Okay, good. Um, um, I mean, I mean, what, what, I mean, one thing. I'm not sure this is a reply, but one thing to say and keep in mind is that. It's not like those rules came from semantic heaven, right? They came, well, I mean, meaning is use or something like that, or meaning comes from use, right? So they came from the creatures that use that representational system. And so then, in general, you're going to expect those rules um, to reflect the you know, needs and discriminatory capacities of the people um, who created that system. And in fact, when I gave you the scrambled I give you like the scrambled population density map view, or the scrambled thermometer view as an objection to Goodman. 
it's actually quite mysterious how you could ever get a system to actually have that interpretation function unless you I don't know, outsourced it to a computer, which did some axiom of choice stuff. I don't know. Um, anyways, um, but so and in a way, I don't think that type of anthrop anthropocentrism is bad um, because it has to do with the meta semantics and how those came to be interpretation. Okay, so I'm sorry. I'm, I always, I'm like thinking through my answer as I go here, but that's that's what these sessions are sort of for. Okay, so you might have thought everything I just said is equally offend defensive of John as it is of me, but here's the level at which I think maybe it's not which is that, for me, it's true that various factors about us in our interpretive needs and our discriminatory capacities will enter into what the interpretation function is. But once it's like, I'm not saying it can't change over time, but once it's kind of relatively set in stone, that's supposed to tell you whether the system is analog or not. But notice once the system is set, for John, our needs and stuff could change after the fact, and our discriminatory capacities could change. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly, and that's where the difference is going to come about, is that I'm going to want to look at that interpretation function and maybe the meta-semantic story and I, some st stuff about discrimination will get in there. But for John, if your needs change after the fact, its status as analog looks like it changes after the fact. And that, but I mean, I, this probably some of what I'm saying does help John also, but I think I can still hopefully drive a wedge. Um, yeah. uh, Thank you, that was a great question. I had Sam's question, but um, maybe, um, just as a follow-up, um, do you have any general things to say, uh, given the, the, the difference that you just outlined, why to prefer your view, uh, your way of handling that over John's? Because, I mean, yeah, you could, you could think of one of these representation systems as, as a kind of artifact where its initial making um, or accidental coming about is determinative of what it is, but it seems, um, seems attractive to me. To, if, if the use of it changes greatly over time, well, why not go with that? Um, are, there, are there more considerations um, that you would bring to bear in a very general way about how to? Yeah, I mean, I, OK, so I mean, one weird thing that could happen, at least it looks like on John's system, is that, I mean, it might turn out that the existence of this structural similarity is like dumb luck. And in fact, what the, the actual metasemantic story of how it was created was like purely stipulative and someone took each of the thousand vehicles and wrote down the content, and laid down the law book. But then people started using it and they didn't realize that's how it worked. They thought that just like taller than corresponded to warmer than, right? And if so, it could support the abstraction by dumb luck. Okay, maybe there's argument for John's theory, I don't know. <laughs> but on my account, that would still be a symbolic system that supported abstraction by luck. Um, and I basically think, I mean, this is a little bit hard because, um, I, don't, I guess I don't need that. Um, and I, 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 I think in that case, the, si the system is symbolic, not analog. You're right, it does support this type of user thing. It's a little bit complicated. I would want to look at the early days, and I would think that those people who are doing that other type of, other type of thing, they're doing the user interaction that John talks about, are, uh, they're, they're kind of getting along, but they're actually making a mistake in a certain way about how the system works. That strikes me as right. Um, however, once enough time went on, like a thousand years of them doing this, I basically think this is a point where because, you know, meaning changes with use in a sense, the interpretation function eventually would shift to the one that John talked about. I mean, this is a really weird case that comes with this interpretation function realism stuff, which is basically the inputs and the outputs aren't changing. But the perturbation function is changing over like this gross amount of time as people used it in different ways. So I, I want to admit that you're right, that after a certain amount of time, um, you know, it would be analog on both our accounts. But in the early days, it would be analog by John and not analog by me. And I, it strikes me as right, but I, um, I admit that the intuitions are hard here. Yeah, I don't mean I don't. I'm maybe not. I'm a little difficult driving the way, so to speak. Thanks. Did you have? I had the same question actually that Sam had, but can, so I'm just gonna. If it's okay, I'll push one more time just to make sure I understand um, your response. So, um, if you're a realist about the rules. Why, and you don't 
you're not you're not going to pick up the sparse idea, or you're sort of yeah. That, that's a bit, but you, but you don't funk for that. That's right. Then, what's stopping you from just supposing all those rules are out there and it's everything everything that's required is in place for there to be these mappings? And you don't. I mean, it'd be great if the aliens showed up, and then you know, then we'd have evidence of that. But like, why? Um, I mean, okay, so I think my answer is this, is this uh, medic semantic stuff. So it's true that if I basically, I'm, I'm fairly liberal about what properties there are and also about what properties can get into an interpretation function, which I am, actually, okay? Then it does open me up to basically saying that a bunch of systems of analog that use crazy properties, what the hell, right? And in some sense, you're right, all those interpretation functions are out there and all those properties are out there. But I mean, it's not, I mean, representational systems don't come from nowhere. They come from representational users. And for any representational system, there needs to be a meta-semantic story about how it is that people use those vehicles to express those contents to generate that rule. And in general, there are limitations on what types of properties and what types of features of the world, you know, creature, creatures with intentional states can pick up on. And so it's basically a meta-semantic story about why only good relations are going to wind up in the interpretation functions of the actual systems that are out there, and none of the bad relations will. Even though in principle, I admit that if a bad relation got in, um, it would actually qualify the system as analog. That's the, that's the general strategy, basically. Yeah. So, could I maybe just add, I'm just curious about well, I had two things. That you advertise it as a, an account that gives degrees of analogicity. And, and, and I, I thought that was cool, so I agree with you. And I'm not sure that that's what it does, though. Okay. So um, I agree that purity is a matter of degree, mass is a matter of degree, and strength is a matter of degree. But it seems like they are features of analog systems. So it doesn't seem like being analog is a matter of degree. You're analog or you're not, and you're this pure, this massive, and this strong. So I, don't, I think it's technically not degrees of analogicity, but I, I don't know. Uh, so I wanted to ask about that. The other thing is just related to strength, so specifically strength. I didn't quite, so I got the example, like we have an ordering and we have a metric, and a metric you know, will, will deliver an ordering, but an ordering, of course, won't deliver a metric. Yeah. But let's say I add, let's say I add another dimension. Let's say I've got like temperature over time, and so it's the height you know, along a dimension, you know, like this is a little graph. Yeah. And then I start coloring the graph to give me uh, humidity yeah. or something Good. like that. Uh, the collection, temperature, humidity, time, will deliver, could deliver humidity, you know, because it's a conjunction of these three things and it delivers humidity. Is that an example of strength? So is, is adding a dimension uh, where you get, uh, where you get this kind of, where you get something like a, yeah, is adding an analog dimension adding strength? Um, uh, no. Um, at least the way we've envisioned it. I mean, it's going to add, it's going to add mass. Um, and if the, if the distinctions that it makes are only structural distinctions, it depends on how you add the dimension. Yeah, I'm just um, that these are all yeah. like, they all yeah. fit the, they yeah. add mass. Then it'll add, then it'll also add. Um, well, last slide here. At least it won't it won't impugn the purity of the system. Um, it will not affect the str the strength. Um, it, I mean, really, stre the strength thing is only about I want to compare two systems. So basically, what I do is take two systems. They have some relations. Does the one structural relations entail the other or not? It, the strength thing, in a way, is somewhat weak because it's not like with purity. In a way, I can give every system a number and it's like a total ordering. All that strength does is says, if I have two systems, two systems will often be incommensurable in terms of strength because one doesn't entail the other, the first doesn't entail the second, and the second doesn't entail the first. So strength, in a way, is a much weaker way to compare systems in compared to purity, because purity is basically a total ordering, but um, strength is not. Strength only applies when somebody is like strictly stronger than the other. Basically, yeah. So I think that in the case you're talking about, I think the answer is no, it doesn't add strength. But the question really would be, compared to some other system, 
Right, but well, I'm imagine so. I've got one system which does a temperature over time, the other one does temperature time humidity. And so then I ask, so I, I see why it does add mass, and I guess I see why you don't want it to be adding strength. But what I want to say is, look, if I have something that's giving me temperature, mass, humidity, that's just going to entail a lot about temp uh, temperature, time, humidity. That's going to entail a lot about temperature and time. Does that make sense? And so strength is, um, well, all right, that, 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 that just says it measures the strength. But like, uh, you know, like, so strength is, so your example was, you know, metric uh, versus a, a simple ordering, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and my example is uh, temperature versus temperature humidity. But if I'm giving you temperature humidity, how come I'm not getting temperature sort of entail? And so why wouldn't that count as stronger? I get the incommensurable part. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I guess. Um, so, is your thought that okay? So basically, suppose I had an ordering of the temperatures, okay? And then what now you're giving me is basically you're taking each of the individual temperature cells and you're populating it with a humidity also. And then even better than that, in the humidity, you're ranking all the, hum you're giving me orderings within each cell too. So basically it looks like what you've got is you've got like an, an, a, a, a big ordering inside each cell of the previous ordering. That does look to me like you've added strength, if that's the way you think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that does sound like you've added strength, when, it's, when I think about it that way. Okay, so, and so but if the original thing I imagined was just like a temperature graph where you got the temperature going up and down over time. And then I imagine coloring the bars at each time. Yeah. And that too would look like an addition of strength to you. Um, I'm not sure what the coloring is, but I, th I think so. The humidity, right? So the height tells you the temperature, the uh, Y tells you temperature, X tells you time, color tells you humidity. Yeah. How much? Uh, I'm not sure, actually. I mean, I really need to think about whether this case really is more, I mean, the fact that it gives me more mass is, is, and more purity is a pretty good start. Um, yeah. But you're thinking it does more than that. I would, I would love to see, actually, as an example that's like this, where you added equivalent mass and equivalent purity, but one example added strength and the other didn't. So the thing is you're adding like two things at the same time, mass and strength. And the way we these all examples kind of came up is we started with examples with the same purity. And then we said, can we tweak it so it counts as more analog? And what's, what's accounting for that? OK, we need mass. And then can we tweak it now and get more? OK, we need strength. And now you're giving me something that gives me both, so I'm not sure how to think about it. Basically. OK, and maybe I just think, like, maybe there's another, like, if you don't like my, if you don't want to accept that what I did added strength, there might be actually another one that's not in here. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I guess mass will just get every time you add a dimension, you're just going to get mass. Right? You Is are. that right? Yeah. Okay. So okay, so you do get that kind of. Thing. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Uh, so uh, Marcel, yes. Just clarify, does it matter if the variables have a correlation with each other or not? Because temperature and humidity correlate. Mm -hmm usually, but temperature and, I don't know, we can think of something that has nothing to do with temperature. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that would not, perhaps, do that mass but not strength because they're not really... Yeah, but so I was thinking, you, you are right that temperature and humidity can correlate, but I was thinking, um, that's, uh, that's not, I wasn't thinking that as a feature. The representational system doesn't say when your temperature goes up, your humidity occurs. That's like a f that's just a fact about the system that's being represented. And so um, I was thinking that that was not an essential feature of the example and that it wouldn't bump up your score. I mean, if they were correlated in a way, I'd need the correlate. The correlation better like come in the interpretation function and come in the nature of the representation rather than being some fact about the world um, in, order, in order for it to bump up the score in any way. Um, yeah. I'm not actually sure how you would do that exactly. Yeah. Thanks, Marcelo. Uh, this is just a super flat-footed um, uh, question. Um, 
Could you say more about what, what turns on the question of what makes a representation analog? Um, so I take it that um, you know, this account is, is improvement on some of the alternative accounts because it gets our intuitions about the extension of analogicity right in ways that the other accounts don't. Um, but as, as a complete and utter newcomer to this, you know, um, you know, I guess part of what I ask is what follows from the conclusion that something is analog for other questions about its semantics or syntax, apart from what would follow just from the definition itself. Yeah. Um, good question, and I don't think I have some, you know, fantastic uh, answer to it. Um, partly because I think there's probably a lot of different notions. I mean, part of what I'm just trying to get at is there's this, you know, there's various distinctions that a bunch of people have made. This seems to me to be uh, an important distinction between different ways of representing. Um, in, a, in a way, it's very highly theoretical. So my hope in some way is that, you know, it'll trickle down to, you know, more specific research. But I mean, if you were, I mean, one open project um, in this area is basically to develop a formal semantics of analog and iconic representation. There's been some work on that, but not much of that. So I think I really think of that as an interesting open project that's having you know, interesting stuff done it right now. And if I'm right, then some of the things I said should influence how you engage in that project. And you should basically be talking about a formal system which is sort of like mine with these structures and you should have a, your double brackets should have a function, should have some relation in them and you should have some relation as an output. And that's what you should be doing if you're engaging in that type of project of formal semantics. But that's also a high, you know, somewhat theoretical project. It's also gonna, if a, if a system is analog versus symbolic, it'll actually have ramifications in terms of the ways you would actually, exp I mean, this is in a more psychological sense, the, the types of errors you would expect in the system, the ways it break down will be quite different for an analog versus symbolic system. In a way, a breakdown in an analog system will be more systematic uh, because uh, the way I pointed out that a single rule influences a lot of different contents and a lot of different inputs, whereas a breakdown in a symbolic system could be quite self-contained if only one rule got corrupted in some way. So it would make a difference for the types of errors you would predict, basically. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure I can say much more than that. Um, thinking of the defective clock case, I was yeah, wondering good. if the realism desideratum supports the isomorphism. Uh, because at least in that case, you've got a lower realism score than we would like. Um, and if other cases of defeat isomorphism have that same characteristic, that would be another kind of response to an attack on isomorphism. Wait, oh, wait, okay. Um, wait, so I, I get why the analog clock um, is a problem for the isomorphism. Um, but I'm not, I'm just, so can you just sketch for me how are you thinking? Doesn't it also get a low realism score? There's no, there's no realism score. There's a, there's a purity score and a mass score. Um, and it may, it does get a lower mass score because there's just less states that are right, right. right. states it's a, overall. It, it's also a, a less desirable tool. Absolutely. In, in, in the way that the, uh, the, the Martian's temperature uh, system would be a less desirable tool for us. Uh, the phenomenon would correspond to that. Uh, so what I was thinking that for that same reason, we've got the, the realism yeah. desideratum isn't. Oh, good. So one, one thing you're making me realize about Peter's example was um, there's something a little bit weird about it going on. I mean, he, he wants to make the point that, hey, even if you didn't have full isomorphism, like this is still pretty good, it looks pretty analog. But I mean, the question is supposed to be about representational systems, not about clocks that skip from four to six. So if you had, if this clock started skipping from four to six, I don't think it has altered what representational system it's a part of. So actually, that's just a faulty, you know, device or something like that. What you really need is a system 
in which the whole system and all the devices in it always skip from four to six and never represent any time between four to six. Okay, that's that's pretty weird. Part of what you're pointing out now is that's pretty weird. I mean, it still makes the point, whatever. And I think such a system still would be like pretty analog, but like didn't satisfy isomorphism. But um, you're pointing out that it, what you were kind of pointing out is that when it comes to the, this realism stuff, I wanted there to be a real meta semantic story about how a certain rule became the rule for that system. And I'm a little perplexed about where this weird clock came from such that someone decided this is what we should do. Maybe everyone takes a nap between <laughs> four and six and no one ever wakes up or anything, so it just jumps. But they, I, I, I'm not sure. But um, part of pointing out is you can, I think you can fight back in that way a little bit that it's weird to have. It's a little bit confusing how that would come about. Yeah. Right, and certainly I mean, it only fails in realism if there's a factor that's producing these things and there is, yeah. you know, it corresponds to the, uh, the siesta system in <laughs> certain countries. Yeah. Uh, I like the siesta system. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Speaking of clocks, is that clock correct? Does it say if it's 5 o'clock? It does say. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, then that's another question. Well, we can ask him upstairs. Uh, thank, okay. you. Thank, you. thank you so much, guys. Oh, thank you.